During the afternoon of the 23rd of March 2019, the cruise ship Viking Sky was navigating in heavy weather when all of a sudden they suffered a complete blackout losing all propulsion and steering. Despite dropping both anchors, the weather was so severe that they continued to be blown around four knots straight towards the shore. Just in the nick of time, with less than a ship's length to go, they managed to get one engine back online and slowly limped back to safer water. We're talking a matter of minutes and we could have been looking at one of the worst shipping accidents of modern times. So what happened? How did Viking Sky come so close to disaster? Viking Sky is a star-class cruise vessel with a length of just over 228 metres and capacity for 954 passengers and 499 crew. At the time of the incident, she was halfway through one of her northern light cruises, which are basically a loop of high-latitude Norwegian ports including Bergen, Narvik, Alta, Tromsø, Bodo and Stavanger. Around 10pm on the 21st of March, she departed Tromsø towards Bodo, where she was scheduled to arrive the following morning. A few hours into the passage, the engineers received a low lube oil alarm for DG2, which just over a minute later returned to the normal condition. Lube oil is used by the engines for lubrication, with the remote sensor feeding the level in the tank back to the IAS, the Integrated Automation System in the ECR, the engine control room. When the alarm sounds, it just means that the sensor has detected the level of oil in the tank has fallen to a predetermined point where the engineers want to receive a notification. In situations like this where the alarm sounds and then returns to normal, it's likely that the liquid in the tank was just sloshing around due to the movement of the vessel. Anyway, in all other respects the passage south was relatively uneventful, but things were forecast to change. The weather was due to worsen, with the wind increasing throughout their scheduled stop in Bodo. Considering the lack of availability of tugs, the captain feared that they wouldn't be able to leave the quay if they were alongside, so the decision was made to cancel the stop and continue south towards Stavanger instead, just as they had done on three out of the previous five voyages. Nonetheless, the weather was still due to worsen, so during the afternoon of the 22nd of March, the crew prepared the vessel for rougher conditions. By 6am the following morning, the wind had increased up to gale force 9 from the southwest as Viking Sky continued through the Trondheim fairway, placing the worst of the weather right on the bow. Down in the ECR, low level alarms from all sorts of tanks continued on and off throughout the morning, around 88 of them in total, all of which returning to normal within a few minutes, most likely due to pressure fluctuations thanks to the movement of the vessel. During the morning watch, they took the routine manual soundings of the different tank levels for the noon report, all of which appeared to be within normal parameters. By this time, they were passing Christiansen, with the weather now up to force 11, so we're talking 60 knots of wind, gusting 80. The vessel's course now placed the weather on the starboard bow, so the movement wasn't too bad, only a degree or two of roll, occasionally up to 5 degrees. The low-level tank alarms continued to appear and continued to reset themselves as fluid levels in the tanks clearly sloshed around. At 13.45, however, two of the three operational engines shut themselves down, both because of low lube oil pressure, which showed up in the list of over 50 alarms, which rapidly filled the IAS screens. Naturally, the loss of power caused the vessel's speed to drop, which, once it got below 6 knots, caused the automatic retraction of the stabilisers. The rolling increased, now up to a maximum of 12 degrees. Fortunately, only 11 minutes after the power loss, one of the engines was restarted, bringing more power online, and the stabilisers were manually deployed to lessen the rolling. But it wasn't enough. Only two minutes later, the only two running engines both shut themselves down, causing a blackout and a complete loss of propulsion and steering. This time, the IAS screens were filled with around a thousand alarms, completely swamping the engineers as they attempted to diagnose the problem. At this point, the emergency diesel generator started itself and connected to the emergency switchboard, restoring power to critical systems like lighting and navigational equipment, but not propulsion, which takes way more capacity than the emergency DGs can possibly provide. Acting quickly, the master broadcaster Mayday and ordered the crew to drop both anchors in an attempt to buy more time as the weather pushed the ship towards the shoreline. Even with 10 shackles out on both anchors though, Viking Sky continued to be blown towards the shore at an average speed of 4 knots. On receiving the Mayday, the Joint Rescue Coordination Centre immediately started scrambling resources on a massive scale. Every helicopter and vessel with capacity to assist was dispatched as quickly as possible to provide assistance. Back on board, with the realisation that the anchors weren't holding, the Master decided to evacuate the passengers as soon as possible. 
Due to the weather, however, transferring by sea, either to Viking Sky's own lifeboats or to another vessel, was considered too risky, so instead they planned for a full helicopter evacuation. Down in the engine room, engineers were focusing all of their efforts on restarting DG2, the largest main generator that was available. They suspected the shutdown was caused by low lube oil pressure, so they transferred oil from storage tanks into the engine's sump tank before successfully restarting it. Frustratingly, the engine continued to shut itself down because they still had active shutdown alarms on the IAS as a result of the continuing pressure variations thanks to the vessel's movement. Once there was sufficient oil to provide consistent pressure, they did manage to get the engine restarted, but struggled to get it connected to the switchboard as the sequence of resetting alarms in multiple locations and manually starting the engine had to be completed in a specific order. While all this was going on in the engine room, the master ordered the activation of the general alarm, commencing the emergency mustering of all passengers and crew. Around 1427, half an hour after the blackout, Viking Sky was drifting sideways towards the shore and passed over a rock charted at only 10 metres. With a draft of 6.5 metres and estimated wave heights of 4 to 6 metres, it was simply down to chance whether the ship was going to touch. A few minutes later, the engineers successfully managed to restart one of the propulsion electric motors, restoring some power to the port propeller and giving everyone a small glimmer of hope. Only six minutes later, at 1437, they had both PEMs online, giving the bridge sufficient power to maintain somewhere between one and five knots ahead, and crucially, start to move away from the reef that was less than a ship's length away. This time, they kept everything in manual and had engineers standing by the controls to prevent overspeed shutdowns when the propellers lifted out of the water as the waves passed by. Normally, these would prevent damage occurring in heavy weather when the load varies, but in these sort of circumstances, you really don't care about long-term consequences as long as you can keep the ship safe right now. As they started to move away from the shore, the first rescue helicopter arrived on scene and started to evacuate passengers, winching them up from the port side of Deck 8 aft. With only one safe location for winching from Viking Sky, the helicopters worked in series between a hold position, Viking Sky and the onshore reception centre around two kilometres away, which was used to both receive passengers and refuel the aircraft. Back on board down in the engine room, DG2 continued to run in manual mode as engineers started more of Viking Sky's engines. Frustratingly though, it wasn't possible to get that first one connected in automatic as there was always the risk of another blackout if the switch didn't go to plan. This meant DG2 took the vast majority of the load for the next six hours until it shut down again due to low lube oil pressure shortly before 9pm. This time though, the other engines were already online and ready to take the load so the power loss had much less of an impact. They were then able to restart DG2 in automatic and get it connected to the main switchboard so that all three running engines could share the load. With power restored, the crew then started to recover the anchors. The port anchor came home first, which point they saw that its flukes had been ripped off, obviously as it had been dragged along the seabed. The fate of the starboard anchor, however, remains unknown, as that needed to be slipped because it was tangled around the bulb when running astern, making it impossible to recover. Viking Sky was now running under her own power, without anchors, awaiting support from a powerful ocean-going tug, which arrived around 2.45 the following morning. Given the ongoing weather conditions though, the decision was made to wait until daylight to make fast. By 8.30, she was finally secure to two tugs, the larger Ocean Response on the bow and the smaller Vivax on the stern. At this point, the master decided it was safe to end the helicopter evacuation, which had continued throughout the night, evacuating a total of 460 passengers over 18 hours. Viking Sky continued on, secured to two tugs heading in towards Mold, where she arrived safely alongside at 16.25 that afternoon. From then on, the question shift from emergency response to working out what happened. Why did the ship lose all power and come so close to being one of the worst shipping disasters of modern times? The underlying cause appears to have been due to the loss of lubricating oil pressure across all of the main generators. The lube oil tanks are built below the main engines, designed by the shipyard and certified by a classification society as compliant with regulations, specifically in respect to the required angles of roll and pitch that will still give sufficient depth of oil to keep the inlet submerged. Without going into a ridiculous amount of detail, the tank just requires a certain minimum and maximum level of lubricating oil to provide sufficient supply for the engines, and that level needs to be at least 150 mil below the top of the tank for ventilation purposes. 
On Viking Sky, however, it was found that the tanks just weren't deep enough to provide a sufficient depth of oil in dynamic conditions, even when filled to their maximum capacity. This meant that as she rolled around in heavy weather, the inlets became exposed, causing the automatic shutdowns to kick in to protect the main engines. As for the alarm levels, well, those need to be calculated based on the geometry of each tank. The high level alarm is simple as it needs to be 150mm below the top of the tank, but the low level alarm needs to be set based on maintaining sufficient suction, even with the vessel rolling and pitching. As none of those calculations were complete, let alone available on board, it was impossible to have the alarm set correctly. Coupled with the fact that the remote monitoring system just wasn't trusted as much as manual soundings, meant that the low lube oil alarms that sounded earlier in the day were just ignored as they appeared to reset themselves. Of course, given what we now know about the lube oil tank design, we know that even at the maximum level, it was possible for the pumps to lose suction, so when the vessel started pitching and rolling in heavy weather, that's just what happened. That caused the engines to shut down, which caused a stressful situation as the engineers attempted to restart the engines. It is possible that the high number of alarms sounding caused a delay in the restarting of the engines, and it is possible that the unfamiliar situation also contributed to the delay. Recovery from the blackout took longer than it might otherwise have taken, resulting in the vessel coming so close to running aground. As always, learning about what happened in this case gives us the opportunity to help to prevent this sort of thing from happening in the future. After all, this is the sole aim of these sort of investigations and the corresponding aim of these videos that I make. Finally, I would just like to extend a massive thank you to this channel's plus supporters on Patreon. Your generous support helps keep these videos free for everyone to view on social media. Without you, this just wouldn't be possible, so thank you all so much.